but I want to get this tattoo on my body, which is you don't have to be the strongest person. You just have to be the strongest you. Because I never asked for HIV. I didn't want to get HIV like no one does. Who the hell wants to get a chronic disease, you know? It's kind of opened my eyes to things that I would never have I would have never thought about before. Like I always said, yeah, I want to go back to South. When I left Southeast Asia, because I was I went to Southeast Asia for a month and a half over the summer. When I left, I said, I want to go back. But had it not been for HIV and dealing with them having to deal with, I would have never thought about even going back to live for a few years and teach English as a second language. Those kind of things. It's it's opened my eyes to actually getting involved and like taking care of my health even better, like doing CrossFit. It's my word for 2019 is fearlessness because it's kind of like, all right, I dealt with something and it's like opened my eyes to this just I want to live my best life. Yep. I've been saying that too. <laughs> and I think that's the like the subtle blessing of getting HIV is even though we don't want it. And for me, that was the biggest fear in life. But if you if you take the right attitude and the right approach to it, it can present the opportunity to evaluate your entire life, physically, health, fitness, emotionally, mentally, your goals, your dreams, everything, and kind of give you the opportunity to reevaluate and, and, and find out what truly matters. Because when you feel like your life is in jeopardy, even though it's not really today, it still gives you that initial shock and it kind of like snaps you out of just the humdrum, you know, emotions of life. I think that's a powerful kind of gift that comes out of it. It's interesting you say that. So that was kind of a theme among the support group when you go down to your for your initial visit and then when you go for your six month follow-up and then your annual visits so each annual visit you, you might be in there with people who have been in the military for 15 years who have been living with hiv for like seven of those years and they're just there on their annual visit or you might be like me where you're you know no kidding first week second week of january whatever it was it was my initial visit. And what's great about it is in the first day you have a support group and it's led by a licensed psychiatrist, but it gives you the chance to like talk to people. That was no kidding. One of the like same thought process went through everyone, which was crap, man. Like I didn't want this disease. The one thing it's taught me is let me live my life to the fullest. Let me be the best person I can be. And I think that's a testament to people who serve because you're already in that mindset of fighting for what you believe in and being proud of of what you're doing and so that's really cool that's another thing i was going to tell you too is when i got told that i was going to be going recommend i was recommended for a full medical board you know i sprung into action you know and i was like all pent up like man they're not going to kick me out like i'm gonna go and i was like going a hundred hundred miles an hour and then once my about two and a half hours of kind of running around talking through things. I got back in my car. I turned on my car. Music that was on my phone, like, automatically started playing through the Bluetooth. And I just, like, sat there for a moment. And then all these emotions ran through. And I was, I, I cried hard for, like, five minutes. But I, but really and truly what it is is because it's, it's exactly what you just said. I don't want to lose a career that I love. Because, like, when I, when I raised my right hand on 26 June of 2014 and said that I would support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And then I did the same thing again on May 23rd of 2018. I truly meant what I was saying. Like, yeah, I'm going to serve my I'm going to serve my country. Like, I'm going to do what my country asks of me. If that means I have to go deploy, I'll do it. You know, like when you start when you sign up to serve in the military, you also were signing up to, if they ask you to put your life on the line, you'll do it. And there's a lot of things that you have to come to terms with when you're thinking through joining the military, when you're thinking through all these things, because you have to think, there's questions that pop in, like, am I okay with dying for the United States of America? And when you say yes to that question, you're like, okay, let me do my job. And so then to have someone, you know, and so like with that being said, like I love my job and that's kind of the, that's kind of the theme that you have is when these kind of things happen, it's like I signed up, I love my country, I love the military, I love my brothers and sisters that are serving with me and you're telling me that like this medically okay disease matters so much that we're going to kick you out, you know, and that's what really hits people the most is man, like the military is, 
it's a good career. It's a good job. Like it's not for everyone, but for those that want to serve and like, it's a good job. And like, I love my country and we all want to serve. We all sign up for a reason. So like, let us do it. Like, let us do what we want to do. You know? Well, I commend you. Uh, thank you for your service. I commend you for having the fight and wanting to really not just fight because you're angry or you're resentful or because that comes across in a certain way, but you honestly want to help make change and make things easier for not only you, but everyone who's going to follow in your footsteps eventually, because more, more people are going to be in your exact same shoes. And if you don't do it, then someone else has got to deal with it. I mean, you know, I don't know if I told you this or not, but you know, cause we're still fighting this thing, man. A, a guy just a few days ago, the reason I kind of was down in the dumps is because another guy got his letter of dis notice of discharge from the secretary of the air force. And it's like, man, what are we doing? And, you know, and, and it's like a double whammy, too, because to, to to get that diagnosis, that's very, very upsetting for a lot of people. And then on top of that, to have this whole system and structure and these people in place that are your life and your world to say you can't be with us anymore is like, I can't imagine that. Because, you know, I've had this thought before, like, man, if I was like you, you know, and like I just worked, at a, you know, I was a bartender and like whatever else, or if I was like a friend of mine who like has HIV, but he works for Chase Bank, you know, when it happened, no one gave it a second thought. He just got diagnosed. He has healthcare through his company, like through Chase, he's got healthcare. No one said anything about it. Like he just kept on living his life. It's very weird because this, the military is one of those think places where you see a lot of social change, but you also see a lot of resentment and resistance to change too, right? Because yeah. like, Look back to the look back to like the um, Brown versus Board of Edu Board of Education, right? When segregation happened, the military was several years ahead of re like reintegrating units before the rest of the country did. The military moved ahead was ahead of its time in allowing women to serve and allowing women to go to the service academies. And we were ahead of our time when it came. To, yes, there were people that had to trail like trailblaze and help change mindsets. But at least at, a, at least at a policy level, we were moving ahead of the social kind of norms. 2011, the repeal, of, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell happened, which means service members were able to live as gay, lesbian, bisexual, openly, proudly. And I, I think I told you this before, but, you know, when that happened, if you were stationed in a state like Mississippi where they did not allow uh, gay marriage, then you were allowed non-chargeable leave from your commander for several days so that you and your significant other could then travel to a state in which you could get married to make it legal. Pretty incredible. <laughs> this is in 2011. The o Obergefell versus the U.S. didn't happen until June 26th of 2015. Like this, is, this was four years before, you know, so you see that there's progress and there's social movement, but then you see a lot of issues where it's like, mm, maybe not. Because now I feel like in a lot of aspects, for example, the ruling for the Supreme Court on transgender service came down for the ban on, on military service. You know, so it's I guess what I'm trying to say is I almost feel like we've gotten to a point where society and the military has kind of just finally meshed. And now the military is moving at the same rate as the rest of society. We're no longer this social justice trailblazing institution. HIV still has a huge stigma surrounding its it's as a disease and really and truly it's not a it's not a thing anymore. I had a wake up call the other day though. I was talking to a friend of mine because we were talking about the C5 airplane. The C5 airplane is the largest cargo airplane in the US Air Force inventory. There's a joke that says if you're at a C5 or if you're at a base that has C5s and C17s, the C17s are always gone because they're always on a mission somewhere flying. But all the C5s are there. Because the C5 joke is, oh, where's the C5? It's broke half the time. Well, that's not the case anymore. They did a lot of revamping. Like they now have um, like the Rolls Royce engines on them and that kind of stuff. But the joke is in this, the joke in the stereotype of the C5 world is they're never flying. They're always broken. And even though they've been updated and and they're great airplanes now, that stereotype of them breaking, you still get nervous when you watch a C5 do the corkscrew. Uh, combat landing, you're like, oh, I hope that that wing doesn't fall off. They don't crash. But then I, it kind of it was a wake up call for me because I was like, man, that's what people think about HIV. Because when they hear HIV, they think 1980s, early 1990s, 
people in the hospital wasting away. And it also affects multiple regions of the country. Um, you and I are fortunate that we live, you know, you live in the LA metropolitan area. I live in the San Francisco Bay area. Like we have a ton of resources, but you know, like there's a lot of people who have HIV that are fortunate like us to live in places like San Francisco, LA, San Diego, New York City, um, Chicago, Washington, DC. But what about these people that are living in Birmingham, Alabama, or, you know, Valdosta, Georgia? Or think of any think of any rural town or not so progressive town, especially in the deep south or parts of the country where very closed minded, conservative, I don't want to think about anything but what I grew up on beliefs run wild. In those areas there are no resources. I don't know if you've seen this there's a map, but we look at the map. When I was down at the, at the Brook Army Medical Military or the Brook Army Medical Center, because the doctor that was down there, we had a discussion about disease update, where we are on research, where we are on a possible cure in the future, you know, where we're at with new medications coming online, like Big Tarby, all these kind of things. But we also looked at the map, which is from blue uh, shades of blue all the way down to dark, dark red. Blue is like tons of resources, tons of like improvements, tons of cases being diagnosed as a good thing because people are seeking treatment. The dark red areas are the areas where the AIDS epidemic is running rampant because people aren't getting tested, people don't have access to resources. And if they do have access to resources and being tested, there are two things that may prevent them from having treatment. One is stigma, telling someone so they just don't get treated or they don't get tested. And then number two, if they do get tested, they are found HIV positive. There's a lot of areas that doctors, like if you're in a small like town, say of, I don't know, let's, let me pick a town. There's a place called Macomb, Mississippi. Macomb's pretty small, right? Probably less than 10,000 people live in that town. If you were to go and get tested for HIV and you come back positive, those doctors may not even have a know-how or a connection to anyone to get you resources to get you help. And then, of course, it's the South. I'm from the South. Or it's a small area where you're living in a town where, oh, my God, you got HIV. And then now your name's out there. You're the talk of the town, and so that there's an, there's just an, there's yet again more issues we've got to because what I, what I'm trying to get at is like we can only do so much, right? We're trying to give awareness, but it's that idea that you and I are ex people that people should get exposed to, right? The, we are happy and we're healthy and we're living a good life. But the problem is you and I are the kind of people that are few and far between because a lot of people just don't want to be outspoken. A lot of people just want to keep it to themselves. Their few friends know about it, and and that's that's perfectly that is perfectly fine. Like if you want to live your life that way, that is fine. As long as you're happy with how you're living, that's great. But the problem is, you know, you and I can only go so far because you and I can't be everywhere, you know, everywhere all the time. There are outspoken individuals, you know, but the amount of outspoken individuals is way outweighed by the number of areas we should we need to be in. We need to go talk to. It's the community building that I think is so crucial and things like your idea for the nonprofit is gonna help create those things where even if you can't physically be around us you can at least have an online community have like-minded goals work towards the same like marathons and stuff like that so just the feeling of community can be a huge benefit to someone who is that would otherwise be struggling with stigma and people around them judging all the time. And I feel for people. I feel for the members of the LGBT community because the thing is, it's not just it's not just the fact that okay, crap, now I've got HIV. It's it's before that. You know, you're you're dealing with the fact that you're living as an open per member of the LGBT community in an area where even that's not okay. Yeah, exactly. Like, and so if you're not LGBT and you're diagnosed with HIV, that creates a whole nother set of problems because if you're living in that area, people are gonna assume that you're gay or bi on the DL, something. So I, I, I hear that argument too from straight guys who are like, man, this sucks. Like I got yeah. HIV, I got it from a woman and now I'm being accused of being gay and bi and people are questioning my sexuality and now I'm getting stigma about that too. And I mean, yeah, I, I it's funny you say that cause like there's a, there's a I met a guy who um, he's 40. He and his wife both have HIV. He got it from his wife. He was diagnosed just a few years ago. You know, what about, there are people who 
especially in the straight community, HIV is not something that straight guys think about, but they should. It affects them just as much. And, you know, it's funny because the, the, my friend who he got it from his wife, he says the same thing. People still question him like, oh, are you really straight? Oh, did you like step out on your wife and get HIV? Did you go like have sex with some guy? It's like, no, <laughs> I've never had sex with a guy. I've never even like thought about it. Because, like, I'm straight. He's like, no, my wife gave it to me. And they, and they were like, well, why didn't she show up earlier that she had HIV? And they're like, because it's something we didn't even think about, man. Like, you know, and it's in. And so for me, mine was kind of a an interesting, tricky situation. And that's another thing that I kind of have an issue with. I will say when it goes back to the military was I went in on September the 4th to the emergency room. I remember going to sleep on Monday on the I think it was the second or the third, whatever it was, but it was Labor Day Monday. I remember I had gone, uh, my mom was in town, so I was taking her around the Bay Area, just kind of showing her the city because she'd never been to San Francisco. So I was taking her around. And she had been uh, sick. Uh, she'd gone to the doctor because she'd been sick with that flu-like virus that had gone around the country um, and like swept the U.S. And she had, had gotten sick with that. And then she came to visit me. It just was all so like so coincidental because I remember I like left, um, dropped her off at the San Jose airport. She like left. I went and took a soul cycle class with a buddy of mine and I drove back home. And I remember feeling more tired than normal. And then I started getting sick and I woke up with like 104 fever on Tuesday. Didn't go to work. I went immediately to the ER. I had a secondary infection as well. And it was just like all of these issues. And they like treated me as if I had that virus. And then I went in a second, the second day I went in because I still just didn't feel better. And then I was like, man, this sucks. And then I went in on Friday again because I just couldn't get better. They gave, like, they gave me an IV. They like did all these things. But, you know, it lasted about 10 days. Well, I had, had it not been for the other symptoms, the fact that I was around my, you know, around a few people who had been sick, they probably would have properly treated me for the seroconversion illness. But like that was when I got, that was, I know for a fact, that week was when my body was at that point of, all right, man, you've been infected for about two weeks. Now your body's ramping up, trying to fight, take control of the virus. Then I felt better. And the sad part was, had it not been for me going back in for a routine three-month checkup, I would have never been diagnosed until like my my mandatory two-year like checkup, which sucks because like because here I here I am in like a monogamous relationship. I had already been tested for like tested negative. Like I think I'm all I'm, I'm all good, right? And then so I like went in for like one more three-month follow-up, not even scheduled by me, but scheduled by the by the public health guys like had it not been for that like i would have had no reason to get tested because like i'm only in a relationship with one person like you, you have any more questions? questions uh not for now but are you are you willing as uh you get updated and as your case progresses to come back yeah update and kind of like track your your journey as it has as it happens yeah and that's perfectly fine and um if you have people who ask you know who have more questions or they can find me on facebook they can you know find me on instagram or i will say though it's it's one of those things that just kind of i take i take one pill and i just kind of forget about it i don't really think about the dis it's just kind of like become second nature i don't think it, i don't really think about it and even when i'm like working on these ideas and like putting together timelines and you know working on a website and working on these different things, working with people. I just forget that I have HIV. I know that sounds crazy. But it doesn't to me. I don't think about it. That's my, my biggest goal is influence, making sure people have a network of, hey, can I do these things? Okay, is my heart gonna explode if I run a marathon? Are my knees gonna be need to, you know, need to be replaced on at age 50? You know, or am I gonna run a 50 mile trail run and wake up tomorrow and like progress to AIDS because it's immunosuppressant, like those kind of things. So like actual relevant information to what they want to, uh, what goal they want to accomplish. But then also to like getting to a point where people just are so involved in their life and so involved in like 
living adventures, traveling the world, like smashing goals, crushing an Ironman, crushing a marathon, whatever. They just forget. Exactly. All right, well, I'm not going to go for a month here. Yeah. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for your service. I commend you a million times over again, and we'll be in contact. And I'm so excited to share this with everyone.